Hey, what is up? Welcome back, IT Dojo, CISSP, questions of the day. I'm Colin Weaver, bring you two questions each time. Here we go. All right, a lot of words in this question. Um, the company you work for, the organization you work for, is in the process of moving its locally installed accounting system to a software as a solution provider. Now, this is going to involve you not only beginning to use their software as a service, but it's also going to involve you moving all of your existing data onto their servers. My question for you is, given the list that I'm about to show you, which of them would be the most likely items that your organization would consider before making the move, before getting into this? I want you to pick two. So they're up, have a look at them, click pause, think about it, click play, we can talk it through. All right, first answer choice says, how about a service level agreement? And that is a yes, that is one of the correct answers. A service level agreement is a very commonly used uh, instrument when you, we are talking about what is effectively outsourcing uh, a service, particularly an IT service, to a third party. And with software as a service, that's what you're doing. Now, there is a whole field of software as a service law, and there's lawyers that do just that kind of stuff. Uh, but a service level agreement is a specific instrument that's going to go in and describe what services are going to be provided, um, who's responsible for what parts of the service, what, you know, in terms of client side or customer side, uh, what are the uh, guarantees as far as the service that will be provided in terms of things like uptime or you know, uh, data rates or you know, mean time to repair, those kinds of considerations. Um, plus, you're also going to have considerations for the metrics. How is this stuff going to be measured? How are we going to go in and quantify that you're actually providing this service? Okay. Uh, there's going to be things uh, in a lot of these SLAs that will go in and define uh, incentives or penalties for exceeding or failing to achieve the defined um, levels of, of, of performance that the customer is paying for. So when you are getting ready to buy a service like this, particularly in this software as a service world that we live in now, knowing what the SLA is between your organization and uh, the, the company that you're buying the service from is critical. You, and in some cases, it'll be negotiated. In some cases, maybe this, the service provider has sort of a general uh, SLA that kind of applies to all customers. I think that's going to be somewhat dependent upon the size of you uh, as an organization and what kind of clout you have walking in with with your, you know, your, your checkbook all nice and ready to go in and define you know, through negotiation, maybe terms that are different than what regular customers might get. Uh, so if you go look at some of the more common software as a service providers that are out there, certainly they're gonna have uh, general descriptions of what they are going to provide, but if you read them, they're, they're pretty much slanted towards them, where they, they, in essence, say, we're gonna do everything we can and we're gonna work real hard, but if we don't do that, then sorry, okay. And that may very well be unacceptable for you as an organization. So that's where the powers that be, maybe it's you, can go in and actually negotiate these things uh, with whoever this provider is going to be. Next answer choice on the list is a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. And that is not one of the correct answers. Uh, an MOU is the key, there's like key words from a CISSP perspective that you should kind of be looking for when it comes to MOUs. Uh, one is the fact that MOUs are generally regarded as non-legally binding. Uh, they are an agreement between two entities, two organizations, to go in and work towards a particular goal. Um, they are they're collaborative agreements where the two parties are voluntarily coming together and agreeing to work towards achieving some sort of objective, and the MOU will go in and describe what that objective is, and then it will go in and describe what the roles and responsibilities are of each of the parties in that. Um, you know, if, if there's going to be financial support for achieving different things or what specific uh, skill sets one party will bring versus the other. And um, for me, I, I remember like 20 years ago watching uh, when the, that TV show Survivor first came out and uh, all the players in the game, they would go in and they would form alliances. And, you know, so the two of them would agree to go in and work together towards some kind of common goal. And um, those alliances really weren't legally binding. So they worked together for a while and then the alliance might get broken. Now, breaking of MOUs is usually defined within the MOU of what does it take to terminate this agreement between them. And, and I think maybe if the people who were on the Survivor Show had a pen and paper, maybe they'd have jotted that stuff down of what the conditions were because they were all backstabbing each other. 
But I kind of think of MOUs like that. It's like it's an, it's an alliance between two organizations to work towards a common objective, and it, you know, whatever the defined objective is. Um, that's all well and good, but not one of the answers here. How about the third choice, a non-disclosure agreement? Yes, uh, that is the second choice that I am looking for. A non-disclosure agreement is when you set up an agreement between two entities. It could be between two organizations or an organization and an individual to go in and define uh, the, the rules surrounding the disclosure of certain information. What can be disclosed, uh, what, what the expected levels of confidentiality are, um, all those things can be defined within an NDA. Now, I don't know that it's really made a lot of uh, discussion at the CISSP level, but if you start reading on this stuff around the internet and going in and looking at all these different law sites that talk about all these different types of um, uh, legal instruments to go in and accomplish these sorts of objectives, uh, one of the ones that I hear people talking about is this notion of a data security agreement um, and how it may in some circumstances be preferable to a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not qualified to argue the merits of that, but I know that primarily when you look at CISSP related stuff, they talk about NDAs, and I don't really see them talking too much about uh, data security agreements. But store it in the back of your mind that that's out there. Um, in this context, a non-disclosure agreement was the other thing that I was looking at because you're talking about your data being on somebody else's servers, and you want to make sure that the people who are over there are doing the right things and that your data is not being disclosed. Um, the same thing would apply if this was all during the actual you know, negotiation part of you going in and and you know, asking, you know, putting out an RFP, trying to get people to go in and give you uh, quotes on a service that you're looking for, uh, you want to make sure that, that there's you know, confidentiality for that information as well. You don't want that stuff to suddenly find its way into the, into the public uh, eye. So um, th they can fit certainly in those situations, and, and this is one of them. That's, so that's the second answer we're looking for. Third answer choice, uh, not the right answer choice, is a software license. Um, usually. You're talking about software as a service where the software in the more sort of traditional context of, of software as a service is that it does not run on your computer. You are very commonly using a web browser to connect to an interface and you're using that software through that interface, but that software is not installed on your computer. It's on their servers on their side and they're providing that software to you as a service. Uh, so therefore you don't need a license for it. Generally the, the need for license, the licensing shifts when things start getting installed on your stuff. So if you're gonna install software on your computer, then software licensing can come into the play. Um, probably the most common place that that would come up, I would think with software as a service, is gonna be that if you're gonna do this with your phone, most software as a service type stuff that you do with your phone, you're not doing through the web browser, it's on your phone, there's an app for that. So you'll install the app and then there's licensing stuff associated with that, but, um, but, uh, but not with you know, more traditional models of software as a service. So uh, not looking for that there. And then the last answer choice, which was also not one of the ones that I was looking for, but may apply in some people's circumstances, which is why I said most likely in the question rather than could be possibly. Um, it's a, an interconnection security agreement. Uh, an ISA is when two organizations agree to connect their resources together. And there, there's, it's usually for some sort of a benefit to them to go in and make this connection together, but they are not part of the same organization, at least not typically. So what an ISA is gonna go in and do is define all of the conditions regarding that connection. And it typically is a technical document that will go in and describe uh, requirements for confidentiality and requirements for firewalls and VPNs and intrusion detection and requirements for auditing. Also going in and describing things like making sure that users are provided adequate training uh, and that there's security awareness and things of that nature. All that stuff could be defined within an ISA. Uh, tends to be much more technical than like you might find with say an MOU or something like that. Uh, so um, in this case it, it's I can dream up some scenarios. This is, this is where you gotta be careful on test trying to talk yourself into stuff. I might just sit around and try and talk myself into why this could be the right answer. And if I'm doing that, then I've, I've probably gone too far. So um, don't do that. All right, let's move on to question number two. Question number two for you today is, which of the following is not one of ISC Squared's canons in its code of ethics? There are two answers here. You're looking for the ones that are not in ISC Squared's code of ethics. Go ahead and click pause. I'll wait. First answer choice says that you are going to protect society, the commonwealth, and the infrastructure. And that is absolutely one of ISC Squared's uh, canons and its code of ethics. So that is not one of the answers we're looking for here. So nope. 
Let's go to number two. It says use processes, methods, and tools responsibly. That junk sounds compelling, but it is not one of the canons in ISC Squared's Code of Ethics. So that is one of the correct answers that we're looking for here. Um, that is from some other organization's Code of Ethics, because I just went in and found a bunch of Code of Ethics documents and took stuff from theirs to make it sound compelling. Um, so while those all sound like very ethical things to do, they are not um, specifically defined in those words in ISC Squared's Code of Ethics. Choice number three says that you're going to act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. Yep, ISC Squared says you gotta agree to do that if you wanna be a CISSP because you gotta agree to abide by their Code of Ethics. Uh, they take it pretty serious, so serious in fact that they ask you exam questions on it. Choice four says that you're gonna provide diligent and competent service to principals. That's in there. That is one of ISC Squared's canons in their Code of Ethics, so don't pick that right answer. Yeah, don't pick that as the answer right now. Do it in life, but not on this question. How about avoiding competing personal and professional interests, which is a fancy way of saying avoiding conflicts of interest. Um, that is not on ISC Squared's Code of Ethics. However, I'm sure that junk is included in those other statements, because if you get down into the ethics of it, their code of ethics is broad enough to go in and say that you should know better than to let you know, conflicts of interest influence stuff that happens on a professional level. So the answer is correct here because no, that is not one of the specific canons, but certainly the spirit of that statement is included. So, but I'm taking this stuff directly from ISC Squared's website and what their word for word description of it is. So that's the second correct answer. All right, and the last answer choice is indeed one of the canons in ISC Squared's Code of Ethics, and that is that you are going to advance and protect the profession. So, yep, that's on there. So it seems to some people, I think, maybe a little silly that you're going to be tested on their Code of Ethics, but if you're going to agree to adhere to it, you should probably know it. So um, that's why you're certainly in some way, shape, or form going to be asked to show that you know what their Code of Ethics is all about. So make sure you don't skip over that in your studies. We have done it once again. Two more questions down, feeling good. I hope that you find them valuable. Please subscribe, click on like, all those cool things. Uh, I dig it. So next time, two more.